project was completed on time and on budget. A great success even under normal conditions. The library is now ready for a truly grand reopening when the time is right. Thank you to the friends and foundation without whose support all this would not be possible. Thank you to the library staff and the library board for their dedication. Like you, Shirley and I look forward to returning to the library and attending Friends events in person. See you then. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we very much appreciate you being with us here today and um, the fact that you know so much about the workings of the library and of the Friends and supporting our community. Um, I'd also like to recognize that indeed um, within our group today, we have current and past members of the Library Board, of the Library Foundation Board, of the Friends Board, of Friends and City Volunteers. We do have some library staff with us. And of course, we have all of you wonderful members of the Friends of the Pacific Grove Public Library. We're really glad you're here. A little bit of housekeeping and then we will jump into our business meeting. Um, so first of all, this is the first time in Zoom environments. We're hoping everybody is going to stay up and online. Um, one tip that was given to me is if your um, connection starts getting a little bit fuzzy, um, if you switch off your personal video camera, that might make a little bit more bandwidth for um, this event. Also, did want to let you know that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our program is going to be recorded. It's not going to be sent out to the public, but it is going to be available for members who aren't able to be here today. Um, we're going to ask everyone to please mute your microphone, and then if needed, we can give you a hand with that. And then finally, um, we will be able to take questions from the audience um, when Alka Joshi is speaking. Um, so those questions can be typed into chat if they could be sent to Dennis then Dennis will be the person who will be sort of monitoring and getting those questions sent over to Alka. So I hope that's all clear. We're so glad that you're here. The first half hour is going to be our business meeting. And then after that, we're going to move into our program. Um, so I would like to call the business meeting to order. 2020 began in a most usual way. Um, we started the year with our um, first Saturday book sales, with our monthly dine out with our partner restaurants. And as the mayor mentioned, the library had moved to its temporary facilities, was doing programs and services there. And the library renewal construction project was well underway at the library. In fact, I think maybe December into January was when the streets were opened up and all the piping and all the um, plumbing was being redone. Then um, with the retirement of library director, Scott Bauer, Diana Godwin was appointed the interim library director. Um, there's a picture of Diana with some of the um, wonderful library staff that she gets to work with and lead. Um, and if the picture looks a little bit blurry, I like to think it's because they are always moving so quickly around at their work. In fact, for the third year in a row, the library staff won the city's Walktober challenge of walking the most steps of any city department. They work so hard for all of us and we are very grateful. Well, then March came along. And as we all know, um, with COVID-19, pretty much everything shut down. Um, nearly everything came to a halt. Um, so we could all fight this terrible pandemic by staying apart and caring for each other. Unfortunately for our city, our state, our country, the world, what that meant is that businesses and local government began to be severely affected by this shutdown. At this time, um, the city's dire economic condition meant that severe budget cuts were being proposed for the library. Um, one of our roles as friends is to advocate for the library. And we were able to come together and successfully have our voices heard by city leadership. So many of you sent letters and emails supporting the library, talking about what the library meant to you and why it was important for our community. Well, your voices were heard and it did make a difference. The budget cut was not as bad as it could have been. As friends, in my letter to you, 
I committed that we are going to advocate that library services be resumed as soon as possible, but that in these unprecedented times, for me, once in a lifetime event, the very rainiest of rainy days, that the friends are here to help. And so your friends board mustered up our resources and tried to figure out how to do that. Um, one of the first areas that was cut with the staffing was having staff being furloughed. And unfortunately, that meant um, a wonderful children's librarian, Mary. Um, although the friends, because we rely on donations, do not regularly pay for staff, we felt that it was so important to keep children's programming going in any way possible. We hired Mary to develop online story times, to develop online programs and ways of reaching children and families in our community. Um, she was able to continue working with the school district, get free books to children through who were homebound through the free school lunch program, um, transition her story times to online and have the kids and families come with her and develop a wonderful new program with the recreation department in Pacific Grove to do some safely distanced as well as online crafting and other types of programs. The friends also paid for one year for a part-time clerical position in the library, and that helped the staff begin to implement um, holds pickups and also actually be able to even bring in the materials from the book drop to check in. Um, our monies were matched by the foundation. They've also supported a half-time position, and they also helped continue children's programs into the fall. As the mayor mentioned, the library renewal construction project was able to continue during the pandemic and was able to be completed um, on time and under budget, as he said. And it, that is such an incredible example of what the strength of the partnership is between the city, between the library board, between the foundation, the friends, and hundreds and hundreds of community donors who supported this project, but not only supported it, dreamed of it, and said that it was important when the world was shutting down. The Friends this past year also decided to commemorate all of the donors to the Library Renewal Project, as well as past donors to various library projects. And when you're able to get in the library, you'll see beautiful new donor windows to acknowledge all of those, all of us who made the Library Renewal Project possible. One of the areas the Friends absolutely believe in and support is reading and books and that connection. And not only do we do that for the library, but through our used book sales, we do that through the community. But we also do other wonderful things that have to do with books too. And I really wanna recognize the Friends Book Club that has been going for many years now that was able to transition successfully online to an online environment and even to read and discuss books that are particularly fitting for our challenging times. Um, of course, our in-person book sale was unfortunately suspended, but we were able to position our online book sales through Amazon and AB Books, and some of the creative folks on the Friends Board and some of the book sale volunteers came up with a Books by the Bag program where you can purchase a bag of books by genre online and either have it delivered to your home in Pacific Grove or come and pick it up. More information about that is available at our website. It's a fantastic program and the use is growing. We also developed a new partnership with Meals on Wheels that's allowing us to provide some, some of our used books to some of the folks who are taking advantage of their services. It's something we've wanted to do for a long time and this became the year to do it. And finally, to support books for the library in 2021, we were selected to be a part of Monterey County Gives with our Bucks for Books program. And we've had 97 donors contribute over $15,000 to purchase new books and materials for the library in this year. Many of you here contributed to that and we thank you. As fundraisers, we take very seriously the donations and contributions that people give to us. Every month when your friends board meets, we review the financial records. Um, we always ensure, and thanks to our wonderful treasurer, Judy Wills, they always are, that our books are perfectly balanced to the penny. So for 2020, it was a most unusual year. We gave $312,000 to the library. 
The bulk of that was for the library renewal project, that is monies that were given to us specifically for that. But you can see some of the other areas that we gave as well. In our operational expenses, I've highlighted a little bit of an unusual thing there too. The $5,000 we gave to jumpstart the Bucks for Books campaign, but that will be returned back to us. So our total expenditures for the year were over $328,000. That is the most money we have donated, I think, ever. And again, because of the library renewal project, we were able to do that. Our income for 2020, unfortunately took a hit. As you can see, it was less than $50,000. And I hope you recognize how important your membership contributions are. Over $20,000 of what we gave, what we were able to take in came from our memberships. As we look to this year, one of the things we wanted to let you know was about having $27,000 that we've already committed to various programs and areas of the library. And that leaves us with a little over $57,000 unencumbered, meaning it's not yet designated. But again, we know that these are just unprecedented times and your board will be looking at the very best way we can continue to support the library and its services during this pandemic. Um, this full report is available on our website as well, if you'd like to take a look at it in more detail. And now I would like to um, introduce our secretary, um, Abby Pfeiffer, who is going to be providing the um, election results. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Kim. And good afternoon, everyone. And I wanna thank everyone for participating in the election of the Friends of the Pacific Grove Library um, board members for 2021. I am happy to report that we uh, reached a quorum of ballots necessary for our election. We needed 59 proxy votes to reach quorum and we received 164. So thank you everyone for returning your ballots by mail. We had 10 nominees for the board of directors this year. Linda Pagnella is stepping down from the board and Sandra Robeson is joining the board as a new member. All of the nominees received a qualifying number of votes to be elected or re-elected to the board. So the members of the Friends Board for 2021 are Gail Abelo, Kim Bowie, Peggy Hansen, Stephanie Herrick, Dennis Marr, Sonia Millings, Lucy Moore, Abby Pfeiffer, Sandra Robeson, and Judy Wills. So I know we're all in our separate places, but let's join and congratulate, give a hand to all of the newly elected members and thank you very much. Thank you, Abby. It's our first time to do an election entirely by through written ballots and we're really grateful that you all came through so much. Um, now the board, the present board, would like to take a moment to recognize our vice president, Linda Pagnella. Um, for the past th three years that Linda has been on the board, she's brought her love for the city of Pacific Grove, her passion for the community, the families, the elders, everyone here, her years of experience at the Pacific Grove Library, serving library patrons, as well as at Robert Down Elementary School in their library. Um, Linda is our enthusiastic dine out champion She's the one who connects us with the businesses, with the chamber, um, and we're very grateful to say that she will be continuing in that role even when she does step down from the board. We are just so grateful to have had the time with Linda and we wanna thank her especially and say, molto grazie, because we know that she has wonderful plans as soon as the world opens up again to see some very special people. So thank you, Linda, you've been wonderful. And we're glad that we still know where you live. The Friends Board meets every month. And one of the things that we do is have listed at the top of our agenda, our purpose. Our purpose as Friends of the Pacific Grove Public Library. 
as you've heard me describe all of the things that we did in 2020, both the usual things as well as some of the very unusual things, I can assure you that these words become the touchstone for what we do. First of all, having a membership and maintaining a membership. Secondly, is really we consider part of our job through our quarterly newsletter, through our help with the library in promoting programs and services, is to really focus attention and encourage people to use the library's resources and services. Um, we partner with the foundation to do the fundraising and the longer term endowment building that will help benefit the library not only now, but as well as in the future. Um, we absolutely support and cooperate with the library, not just in developing library services, such as some of the new online ones that we've had, but just that whole phrase, the facilities for the community. We just feel that the work on the library renewal construction project truly has built a tremendous facility for decades to come. And finally, our commitment to supporting the freedom to read, the right to knowledge and information, is really expressed by um, the monies that we give the library to support books and materials, but also are continuing to get recycled sustainable books back in the hands of our community. These are all very important principles for the friends that we take very seriously. Well, if 2020 was the rainiest and darkest of times, we are really looking forward with hope to 2021. We feel that there are good times ahead and we as the friends will be there um, to help make sure our community can benefit from them. Of course, we mourn the loss of our, that our community has suffered um, during these days. Um, the loss of community members, friends members, the loss of special places and special times. But um, we know that working together, we are going to be able to continue making a difference. And one of the areas that we are so excited about is our wonderful new renewed library. Um, as the mayor said, we are looking forward to a grand reopening. Um, I can tell you the number one question I get from everyone who loves the library and wants to be back in the library is when is it gonna reopen? And I definitely wish I could tell you a specific date, a specific time. Um, we don't know that yet. Um, we know that there are going to need to be enough staff to open and run the library in whatever form the library is gonna look like when it opens after the pandemic eases. We know that there are gonna be health conditions that are gonna to have to be met and that the um, county health director and the city are gonna to have to approve whatever the plan is. So as you can see, that's gonna take a while. There's gonna be some time before that is known. Our job is the at the Friends is to support the library in making that happen, but also in promoting when that will happen. So I can assure you, as soon as it looks like things are easing up, things are getting better, the money is there, um, Diana and the library staff will let us know and we will definitely spread the word to all of you. Until that wonderful day, however, um, one of the things that the Friends also funded last year was a tour of the inside of the newly renewed library, just a brief taste. Um, and so we'd like to take the opportunity to play that for you now so we can all, even though we're separate together, um, enjoy what our library is gonna be like. The Pacific Grove Public Library has been a well-used civic treasure since 1908. Operating for 112 years certainly requires some upkeep, and we're thrilled to announce that our year-long library renewal project is now complete. We look forward to opening our doors to the public so very soon. The purpose of the renewal has been to modernize in a reverent manner, preserve the history, improve for the present, and prepare for the years to come. When you first enter, you will see a more open, light-filled, accommodating space. The service desk is now oriented towards the front door to face patrons entering the library and is easy to spot thanks to the new brightly colored carpeting. 
The children's area features kid-sized shelves with clear sight lines to ensure safety and accessibility for all. The large windows that occasionally display children's craft projects are now inscribed with the names of all donors to this restoration project. All areas of the library have been updated with fresh paint, new flooring, energy-efficient lighting, and ADA accessibility. We are so proud of the way that the reconstruction has created graceful transitions between the library's various updates throughout the past 112 years. The Carnegie section in particular has seen refinished arches, windows, and ceiling, repaired and refinished cabinets and shelving, and lighting replacements to replicate the original chandeliers and wall sconces. We've updated our existing seating and added new furniture to be enjoyed when we're finally able to reopen. Our restroom area has been majorly upgraded to five individual stalls with a modern trough sink and a family restroom just around the corner. Safety is always a high priority and our procedures have been updated to operate safely amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. All books are quarantined for five days before re-entering circulation. The library is currently providing services online and through curbside pickup, and once staff can welcome you back inside, it is important that health and safety requirements be followed. The mission of the Pacific Grove Public Library is to provide a welcoming place and a balanced collection while preserving the past and planning for the future. This ambitious and successful renewal is thanks to the dedication of library and city staff, the Library Friends and Foundation, the City Council, volunteers, and so many generous donors, businesses, and community members. We thank you for your support and hope to see you in the library soon. that a wonderful video. Um, it was produced by a local CSUMB graduate, Sarah Horn, and her partner Justin created the original music for that. Um, just, oh, we just can't wait. It's going to be so exciting to be in there and be together again. Looking at it, one of the things that it made me think was how important a library is as a community center and as a place for the community to gather. I know at the beginning, some of you were chatting and talking and um, so many of us get to meet our neighbors and our friends and get to meet new neighbors and friends um, at the library. It's one of those things that, um, boy, Back in the day when I was working in libraries, the thought was, oh, well, with computers and the internet, you're not going to need libraries anymore because you can get everything you need online. And I think that's definitely one thing that this pandemic is teaching us is the importance of being able to have things online and connect with each other virtually as we are right now, but also the fact that it leaves many people out. Um, we actually got some um, handwritten and mailed notes from members who regretted that they did not have computer access so they could not join our meeting. Um, but we also know that having in-person interactions again is gonna be a little different and we're gonna have to take some precautions and look out for each other in the way that we've been doing that now. Um, I think this really the last year has been a testament to how important the library is, how important the library staff are to our community and the ways that people are willing to contribute and to help support that continuing. So um, we have much to look forward to in this year. Um, we have a ways to go before we're gonna be able to be together in person again, um, but we really can't wait. And as your friends board, your newly elected friends board will be doing everything we can to support the library, to support the city, to work with the foundation, the library board, our volunteers, all of you to make that day happen soon. Um, so I think with that, um, I will close our business meeting and now we will get to um, the wonderful program 
that we have planned today, um, highlighting the henna artist and speaking with author Alka Joshi. And I'd like to invite Linda to come back and um, give a wonderful introduction to Alka. Thank you, Linda. One more job as vice president. Thanks everyone, good afternoon. I'm uh, Linda Pagnella, outgoing Vice President of the Friends of the Pacific Grove Library. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Alka Josie was born in India and has lived in the US since the age of nine. She graduated from Stanford University and worked in the fields of advertising and PR before starting her own marketing consultancy. In 2011, she obtained her MFA in creative writing from the California College of Arts in San Francisco. The Hannah Artist is her first novel. We will all be happy to hear that Mira Books will be released the sequel, The Secret Keeper of Jaipur, this July. Elka is currently working on the third book in the trilogy, which Mira will publish in 2022. She's also serving as an executive producer on the upcoming TV series of The Henna Artist in development for Miramax TV. Elka shares her writing and publishing process on her YouTube channel, and I encourage you all to take a look. It's really fun to watch. The Henna Artist has received rave reviews it was chosen by Reese Witherspoon for her book club last spring. Recently in the Goodreads Best Book of 2020, the henna artist received more votes than Ken Follett's The Evening in the Morning, Isabel Allende's A Long Petal of the Sea, and Alice Hoffman's Magic Lessons, among many others. As a member of the Friends of the Pacific Grove Library, Alka has served for many on the author committee, helping bring authors and our membership together. We're so happy to have you with us today, Alka. Thank you so much for having me. And um, hello, everybody. Happy Sunday. Uh, and also, you know, I wanted to give a shout out to the PG Library uh, and to Kim because they were one of the early supporters of the Hannah Artist when we were first planning the launch back in March. Remember March? Remember the start of the pandemic? And so we had to, of course, uh, cancel any plans at all for the launch. But, uh, you know, before it became a Reese Witherspoon pick, before it became a New York Times bestseller, uh, the friends of PG Library did support the book and wanted to help out with the launch. So I just wanted to give a shout out and say thank you so much. Libraries do make such a difference in people's lives. And I know it, they made a huge difference in mine, of course. You know, I think every writer is probably a shy girl who is a reader when she's growing up and she hangs out at the library and she reads everything she can. And when, when she has to go to a social occasion, she probably wonders like I do, what do I have to say to people? I would much rather be at home reading my book. <laughs> so um, let me share with you a little bit about my 10 year journey to get here. Because a lot of people say, wow, you know, you're like an instant overnight success. No, that is not the case. It took actually 10 years for me starting out uh, learning how to write a novel and then learning how to go deeper into characters and learning how to um, get a lot, uh, you know, uh, understand how to develop compelling um, uh, scenes to be able to get to a point where I can talk to readers now about it and, you know, have it uh, be in the bookstores and see it on the shelves. So. What happened is that in 2008, I was running my marketing and advertising consultancy, which I had been doing for several decades. But once again, we were coming up on a recession. And this time it was the mortgage crisis. So a lot of banks had to be bailed out. A lot of you know, financial institutions had to be bailed out. And what that meant for my agency was that suddenly I had fewer projects, projects were getting canceled. And you know, I had been through several recessions before with my agency. And so I knew it was just gonna be a matter of two years. I just have to write it out and the business will come back and um, advertising expenditures will go up again. So I thought, well, what am I gonna do for two years? 
Well, my husband had been encouraging me to go write a novel because he said, you know, honey, I think that whenever we go out to dinner, you're always making up stories about people next to us. <laughs> so why don't you get paid for doing that? Why don't you just start writing and publishing and making up stories that way? So I thought, okay, I'll enroll in an MFA program, which is two years, perfect timing. And from 2009 to 2011, uh, we were living in San Francisco at the time. And I went through something called the California College of the Arts in their Masters of Fine Art program in creative writing. And it just so happened that at that time, there were a couple of instructors there who had recently written novels. And I wanted to study with them because if you have recently studied, if you have recently published a novel, then you might be able to see some value in my work and be able to um, forward it on to your agent, to your editor, you know, the, the people at this moment who uh, know about what is publishable. So my aim, uh, because I don't do anything without a goal, uh, my aim at the end of two years was to come out with some sort of a novel that I could keep working on and that I could eventually publish. Uh, at the same time, my younger brother had bought a condo in Jaipur. We used to live in Jaipur when I was in Rajasthan. It was one of the five cities we lived in while I was in uh, India. And also um, it is a place where all of my extended family still lives. So. Uh, I knew that I was going to go back to Jaipur with my mother. Uh, my mother wanted to go back and visit for longer periods of time. And so she said to me, why don't you drop me off, go back and finish your semester or go back uh, and finish you know, until your next break and then come back and pick me up. So we did this about four or five times during that period that I was taking uh, my MFA. And uh, during that time, I got to spend more time with my mother than I ever had since I was 18, went away to college and never uh, lived at home again. So I'm spending time with my mother. We're going to the Jaipur Palace and she tells me about the time that she had an audience with the Maharani Gayatri Devi because as all of the families that were immigrating abroad were coming to her attention, she wanted to meet with the mothers and the wives uh, of those families. Uh, and then we also went to the Hawa Mahal. We ate kulfi in front of the, the Hawa Mahal. And she told me about putting coconut oil in her hair and mine when I was a little kid. I had forgotten all about it. Um, and of course, you know, she, she took me to her old school and we talked to the current headmistress there. Uh, and so I got a chance to sort of see what her girlhood was like. And then I started asking her questions. I said, mom, what was it like before your arranged marriage at 18? What did you like to read? What did you like to do? Who did you hang out with? What kind of film stars were your favorites? And then I started uh, looking at those old films that she liked, uh, you know, looking at those old Life and Look magazines that she really liked looking through. And it gave me this idea of a woman beyond motherhood. So it gave me an idea of what my mother's life was like and maybe what she could have been had she not been a very traditionally raised woman who had an arranged marriage at 18 and then immediately starts uh, having children. She has three children in four years. She's still only you know, 22 when she finishes and uh, she's got this whole family to look after. My father is a young engineer. He is very ambitious. He is constantly getting promoted or moved to another city. And so my mother is constantly moving us to other cities, getting us acclimated. And then at 10 years of marriage, he says, uh, I wanna go abroad. I wanna do a particular research to get my doctorate and I'm very interested in environmental engineering. And there were only two countries that were doing that at the time. There was a university in Germany and a university uh, in Iowa. Uh, and so we ended up at Iowa State University. So at 10 years of marriage, my mother is acclimating all of us to a whole new culture, to a whole new, not just a school system, but another language and another culture and another way of being. So I felt like my mother's life was never her own. What if through fiction, I could give her a life that she always afforded me? She always said to me, you can decide whom to marry. You can decide what kind of um, career to have. You're going to get to decide if you want children, if you don't want children. Whatever you decide to do with your life is your own. I'm never going to tell you what to do. The only thing I require 
is that you learn how to make your own living. You learn how to sustain yourself financially before you get married. This is super important. You need to develop an idea about yourself and gain that esteem that comes from uh, having your own money. So um, I just thought, you know, that was such a gift that she gave to me, not having been raised that way herself. So what if I could give the gift back to her? A fictional character like Lakshmi who sets up her own life, her own career, the way that she really wants to be in her life. So uh, I work on this novel and it becomes the henna artist and it becomes my thesis for my master's. Shortly after my thesis presentation, however, my mother uh, died. She unexpectedly, she got sick, she died. And so I thought, oh my God, I can't work on this anymore. I was so bereft, I put the novel away. And by now uh, the, the recession is over. And so I have business again in my agency and I go back to work. Two years later, my thesis advisor, one of them calls me and she says, Alka, what happened to that novel that you were working on? It had so much promise. Can we like take it out and let's work on it? It'll help you get over some of your grief. So I said, okay. So I brought it out and she and I worked on it about a year. And then she sent it off to her agent in New York. That is how I got my agent because she called me within a couple of days and she said, oh my God, I love this novel. I love Lakshmi. I love the whole concept of henna. Let's start working on it. And I said, Emma, that's fantastic. So when do we publish? And she said, oh, well, first I'd like you to do some things in the novel. So she gives me a whole list of things to do, including uh, the fact that I cut out over the next several years, about 130 pages out of the novel, cut out some characters, cut out some scenes. And I just thought, okay. I said, but Emma, we've done all of the things that you asked me to do. Now, can we get it published? And she goes, oh, well, gosh, Elka, I'm just a literary agent. I can't tell you how to do any of that stuff. Now you need a developmental editor like Heather Lazar, one of your uh, board members. <laughs> and so uh, I said, oh, okay, well, what do I do there? And she said, you know, a developmental editor is somebody whom you pay. Uh, this is how they make their living. They go through the novel, they read it several times and they will give you an editorial a letter. And that will tell you how to enhance your characters, how to enhance your scenes. Maybe if there are some areas where the book is falling short, they'll tell you about all of that. So, okay, I steal myself to spend some money on a developmental editor. I pay them. They look over my work and Ronit, who is my uh, developmental editor at that time, she sends me back her editorial letter. Now, what am I expecting? I'm wanting her to, of course, say, this book is fabulous. This is a masterpiece. You will make so much money off of this book. It'll be a bestseller, no, no problem, hands down. Uh, and your agent does not know what she's talking about. She really shouldn't uh, be keeping you from being published. But that is not what Ronit says. Ronit's 12 to 15 pages of editorial comments are all about how I can make the book better, about how I can strengthen a character or strengthen a scene. And have I thought about addressing this issue and that issue? And I just got really upset because I thought this is my novel. This is coming out of my imagination. It is my piece of fiction. Why does anybody else get to tell me what to do with it? This is not fair. No. <laughs> and so I just put the book away. I just said, I am not going to deal with this. I am not even looking at that editorial letter anymore. And I just got back uh, to work, uh, busy with a project. Eventually, I was running across uh, something, you know, I was looking for something in my um, desk and I ran across the manuscript. And I just turned to a page and started reading. And as I read, I thought, oh, I like this novel. I like Lakshmi. I, I want to know where Lakshmi is going. I want to know what Kantha is going to do and Malik is going to do. And you know, what in the world is Radha up to now? So I thought, okay, well, if it still holds my interest after all this time, maybe it's time for me to look at that editorial letter again. And this time, because I've had some distance from it, I can look at the letter and not see it for the uh, sort of critical work that it is. Now I see that what Ronit was trying to say was, this is a really good piece of fiction. Now here is how to make it better. 
And so I'm able now this time to look at all of her comments and suggestions and actually work on them and realize that they are making it better. So I finish that draft and now I'm finally up to probably draft 28, 25, something like that. I send it back to Emma in New York and I say, okay, Emma, now can we please get it published? Emma sends it off and uh, she, HarperCollins ends up buying it with an imprint that they have called Mira Books. So Mira Books now has an editor uh, who is going to work with me even further on refining the novel. And she sends me a couple of different things that she'd like me to consider. So, you know, now I am looking at uh, a whole new set of edits and changes that I have to look at. Um, now, 18 months, the book was bought 18 months before its release in March. So the release date is, is scheduled 18 months in advance. They don't know what's going to happen uh, by the time the book is released. But 18 months in advance, they're working on the cover and they did a beautiful job on this cover. I did not have anything to do with this gorgeous cover that they came up with, which is actually the color of henna. And it's the, um, the palace of Jaipur as maybe a young Lakshmi is coming out of the palace after one of her meetings with the Maharani's. So um, they were, they're working on the cover, they're working on publicity, they are setting up a tour for me in the United States and in Canada. And the idea is that if the book does well in the US and Canada, then they will open up the venues in uh, Australia for sales, and then the UK, and then finally to India. And then you know across the world, they'll start, start selling the world rights. And at this point, you guys, I'm happy to report that the uh, henna artist is being translated into 23 different languages. So it has made it all the way around the world by now. All right, so, um, so uh, uh, while Kathy and I are working on the final edits also, Harper Collins is getting ready to sell the hell out of this book. This is going to be one of their big books of 2020. That is what they have decided. And so they have sold it uh, into all of the independent bookstores, into all the Barnes and Noble. There are 600 Barnes and Noble across the country. And in Canada, the equivalent is called Indigo Stores and they have about 250 of those stores. So they've sold it all there. They've sold it into Amazon. They've sold it into Target and Walmart and Costco. These are big kahunas for any anybody to sell into because they buy in volume. And so they are all ready for this release. It is poised. We are ready to go. Just push that button. And then instead of pushing that button, COVID starts. <laughs> and so every single book release, including the book launch that Kim and I were working on gets canceled. Everything gets canceled. I don't even get to talk to one reader. And I just thought, okay, kill me now. Just, just kill me now. I have spent 10 years working on a novel that nobody is ever going to see. And I, I just like, I just started crying. I just started crying. I just thought this is, this is ridiculous. What karma am I carrying around from a past life that is making me, that is making uh, this kind of bad luck happen? Am I the bad luck girl like Radha? So um, a couple of, I think a week or so later, something like that, I get a call from Kathy, my editor at Mira Books. And she says, I hope you're sitting down because I have some really fantastic news. I said, okay. She said, Reese Witherspoon is going to announce your book on May 1st. And you don't get to tell anybody. You cannot tell anybody that Reese Witherspoon is going to announce your book or that she has picked your book uh, in advance of her announcing it on the first of the month. So for the next four or five months, you are going to be working with the Hello Sunshine people, which is her book group, and you're going to develop social media content. Now, I went into social media, you guys, kicking and screaming. I wanted to have nothing to do with social media. I am not a Facebook uh, fan. I am not a fan of uh, Twitter. I don't do any of that stuff. At least I didn't until my publisher said, you need to have a social media presence. Uh, because keep in mind, I had never written a book for a magazine article. I had never published a short story. This is the first piece of fiction I have ever written in my life. So it's not like I had a pedigree that they could hang their hat on. So they needed me to develop a social media presence so that people would learn about the book. So I go, oh my God, no, this, this is a brand new thing I have to learn. First, I have to learn how to write the damn book. Now I have to learn how to promote the book. So then, um, so I tried to uh, learn from uh, YouTube videos and everything that's on the internet. And I do start developing a social media presence. 
And so by the time that Reese announces her book, a couple of different things have started happening. The bookstores have started to open a little bit. Uh, they have uh, figured out how to do curbside shipping. Uh, so have libraries, right? Uh, curbside shipping, you can pick up the book here or just drop off any books that you owe us. And Amazon has started to ship out more than just essential services like toilet paper. Finally, they are starting to ship out books again. So thank the Lord. Uh, you know, once Reese announces and she and I have our little uh, conversation on her uh, social media platform, then uh, people start getting access to the book and they start buying it like crazy. And then suddenly within a month, we are on the New York Times and the USA Today and the LA Times and Toronto Globe. Uh, the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, all of these different bestseller lists, we are on them. And then within a month and a half, we start getting calls about all of the screen adaptations. So I called my agent in New York and I said, help, what do I do? <laughs> I don't know how to handle this whole uh, kahuna because this is a whole big thing to try to learn uh, about how you as an author handle requests from screen adaptation companies. So uh, Margaret said, we are going to uh, contract out to the Gotham Group in Los Angeles and they field all of this kind of inquiry and get you through that process. Okay, great. So now I have a wonderful CEO I'm working with at the Gotham Group, Ellen Goldstein Vane, and um, huge supporters, by the way, of um, uh, Biden and Harris and, and, <laughs> and so I was really excited. I go, yay, I get to work with somebody like that. And Ellen is super sharp, super smart. And so she, first thing that she asked me is, do you see this as a movie or do you see this as a TV series? And I said, well, you know, I'm a binge watcher. I love Netflix uh, shows that I can binge. I love uh, shows on Amazon and Hulu and uh, HBO. I love to binge on all of that stuff. And I try to limit myself to just one episode a night and I cannot, I do not have that kind of discipline. So I'll do two episodes, I'll do three episodes. And I wanted the henna artist to be one of those kinds of series where you cannot stop yourself from watching it. So I said, I really would like to see this as a TV series. I think 90 minutes of a movie is not going to be able to cover everything that I want uh, to show in this book. Because more than just the story, this also has layers of classism, casteism, colorism. Uh, it also has layers of what is happening politically in India at the time in the 1950s. It also has uh, layers of what Eastern and Western medication can do for a body, uh, especially if you combine those two modalities. So I wanted all of that to come across in many uh, multiple episodes. All right. So she said, uh, she went back to all of the proposers and she said, okay, this is what the author wants. Now uh, we have uh, proposals coming back to us. And uh, I, I thought, oh my God, now what do I do? Because uh, there's, these proposals are like 40 pages long and they're like, we give you this kind of credit, we give you this kind of percentage and this kind of percentage and that kind of money. And so I'm like, okay, now what do I do? So uh, I called up my agent again and I said, I don't know how to do this. And she said, okay, you need to get yourself an entertainment lawyer. So now you guys, for the first time in my life, I've never had a lawyer in my life myself. And so now I have an entertainment lawyer and he went through all of the whole thing with me and he went through every page and what this term means and that term means and so on. So um, uh, I chose the proposal with Frida Pinto, who really wants to star as Lakshmi. And that was important to me because Frida is a very thoughtful person. She has actually considered how uh, to portray Lakshmi. Uh, she is very serious, which is something I appreciate uh, because in Hollywood, you run across a lot of people who are kind of pseudo serious and <laughs> she really is a serious person. So that was fun to, to know and to see and to deal with. And then her, uh, another one of her executive producers on the project is Michael Edelstein. And Michael oversaw the production of Downton Abbey when he was in charge of NBC Universal uh, out in England. So he, when he read this book, he's the one who sent it to Frida and said, Frida, oh my God, you got to read this book. It's fantastic. And you should be starring as Lakshmi. You'd be perfect for it. So uh, Michael thinks that this could be an Indian Downton Abbey, which would be fantastic because uh, it means it's gonna be lush, that there's gonna be really high production values. And uh, so I'm really excited about that because that's how I see the whole novel playing out. Okay, 
So that's where I am right now. And last year um, in, in this process, you know, I was thinking about writing the next book and Malik, the character whom everybody seems to really love, kept bugging me in my head saying, okay, now why don't you write my story? Now I need you to think about what my story is and I need you to write it because you've already written so much of it that didn't make it into the henna artist. So I thought, okay, I started writing his story and it came very quickly. So in June, on June 22nd, The Secret Keeper of Jaipur will come out and it will be Malik as a 20 year old. And he is starting life, um, you know, in that kind of, uh, you know, he is a little bit of a um, scallywag. <laughs> so, you know, he, he does get into all kinds of uh, dangerous kind of situations maybe, and he's always negotiating for things. So Lakshmi wants to make sure that he is going to have a legitimate career. She gets an apprenticeship for him at the Jaipur Palace. He goes down from Shimla to do that. At the same time, uh, he discovers a few secrets at the palace that he has to decide uh, if he's going to divulge them or if he's gonna keep them to himself or if he's gonna consult Lakshmi and say, hey, what do I do now about this stuff? So that's what uh, number two sequel is about. And then I am currently researching number three, and that will complete the trilogy. And this one will be about Radha as a, an, an adult. She's going to be in her early 30s. She's living in Paris with her Parisian husband. And uh, she has two little girls. She has the family she always wanted. She also works as a perfumer. Uh, she was so good at mixing paints and mixing the henna paste uh, uh, in her early life that when she got to France, she really got interested in how ingredients of perfumes and fragrances are put together. So she's been working in that industry. She has worked her way up from uh, in a lab, uh, fragrance lab, and now she's working for a master perfumer and she wants to create her own signature scent. But at the same time, she, there's a knock on the door and who is waiting there but the baby she gave up in the henna artist. He is now 18 and he has found out accidentally because his parents never wanted him to know but he has found out that he is adopted. So now how is she going to handle this comeuppance, right? You know, we, we sow what we reap, so. <laughs> or we reap what we sow. <laughs> and she's gonna get to do a little bit of both. <laughs> so um, anyway, so that's book number three. And uh, let's see, and then um, I'm also starting to uh, get it, um, a graphic artist together so that I can start the graphic novel version of the henna artist because it could be so rich and so beautiful. And not everybody learns through words. Some people really learn through visual. Uh, input. So I want to make sure I, I get that graphic novel together and my publisher will publish it. But uh, if you guys happen to know of a graphic novel illustrator and you think they would be perfect for a uh, project like this, please pass it along to me because I can sure use uh, the uh, recommendations. Okay, so now who has questions and uh, who wants to ask the first question or the second? <laughs> Well, Alka, I just have to say, what a journey. I mean, the book is wonderful. It's so exciting to know that there are going to be more stories unfolding, but just your journey as the person that I've known for a while, just to have all of this happen. What an amazing, amazing journey. <laughs> I think maybe there's a fourth or fifth book in there just to sort of <laughs> writing during the pandemic years or something. Um, I, but I, I'd like to start off just by saying that I know that um, because of these very different and difficult circumstances, you've really had to connect through different ways other than the traditional. Um, how many book groups have you, book clubs have you have you now talked to online? So now I've done over 300. I think I'm at 311. Yeah. Oh, and um, so one of the things I realized during the pandemic is if I were a writer and I, uh, oh, if I were a reader, and I were reading something, I would wanna to talk to the author. I would wanna to go to author events. And I'm not getting a chance to do that, of course, during the pandemic. So wouldn't it be nice if I could actually invite the author to my book club? So I put the word out on social media to all the book clubs uh, that are out there. And I just said, hey, if you have a book club coming up and you want me to talk at your book club, please invite me because I am a captive audience. I, I'm here stuck in my house too, you know? And at least on Zoom, I get to see all of you without your masks on, which is kind of nice. 
Because right now, walking around Pacific Grove without with, with my mask on, I don't recognize people, and I bet they don't recognize me either. I just I, I don't recognize anybody. Uh, so it's kind of nice to be able to visit with people on Zoom and see them in their environments. So yeah, it has been a very different kind of um, communication with readers, but it's actually been a far more enjoyable one because I get to be in my own home. I don't have to travel anywhere. I don't have to schlep luggage around on a plane and take all of these trains and automobiles and whatever to get to my destination or eat rubber chicken in hotels. You know, <laughs> I get to just be at home and very comfortable here in Pacific Grove. So I, I love it. That is, that is very fortunate. Um, so what we've done is we've opened up chat and if anybody who's out there would like to send a question in, um, Dennis will be sort of monitoring them and then Dennis will be um, picking from them. I know that we've had a few come in already. Um, so Dennis, are you ready for me to switch it over to you and head to a couple of those questions? Maybe one question per, I know a couple of folks have sent in a couple questions, but if we try to hit maybe one question from each person so far. That would be great. Uh, yes, I am ready. And the first question is, uh, uh, what message about life in India and the status of uh, women in India are you trying to convey to your readers? Uh, I think I have a couple of different things that I'm doing. You know, initially I started this as a reimagining of my mother's life, but then I realized as I was going on through the years and layering on more and more information in the book, that I'm really talking about women and the agency they get to have, don't get to have, how much of it they get to have throughout cultures. And I fundamentally believe that women deserve to have all the options on the table in front of them as they make decisions about their lives that will affect their destiny forever. So, you know, that decision could be whom they marry, how many children they have, whether they want to have children, all of those decisions. I think women deserve to have all of that information in front of them. So that's one main thing I wanted to get across. The other thing that I did in the novel, and I didn't realize I was doing it until I was almost done with the novel, is that I am saying, this is my love letter to my heritage. Uh, when I was a new immigrant in the United States, in Iowa, in Kansas, in Missouri, you know, the heartland of this country, uh, the kinds of things I read in the history books about India were not representative of the India I came from. So the uh, idea of India was always couched in these terms, underdeveloped, third world nation, starving, illiterate people, um, you know, dirty, uh, uh, diseased, all of these kinds of words were being used about India and bantied about. And I'm being asked things like, where did you get your tan? Oh, you're Indian, what tribe are you from? Um, or um, uh, things like, oh, do you sleep on the floor or do you sleep in a bed? Or things like, wow, your English is pretty good. Where did you learn your English? And what I realized is that Americans had so little idea of India and I had so much more idea of what Americans were like than they did of my home country. And that all their perceptions of uh, India were very negative. And so I became ashamed of my own culture. I became ashamed of my own heritage. And I thought, hey, uh, you know, maybe I just won't tell people that I'm from India because I don't want any more of those questions that I can't answer. As a nine or 10 year old, I can't answer a question like, what about all those starving people in India? I don't know how to answer that as a child and I doubt if any, anybody else could either. So um, for a long time, I didn't want to have anything to do with India. And then as I started writing, and as I start, I, I think probably in my 40s, as I started reading a lot of information about India, as I started talking to my dad a lot more about the history of India and the history of the British in India, I realized so many things. Like um, before the British came, the British were in India for about 200 something years. Uh, but before they came, India's GDP was 23% of the world market. And then by the time they left, uh, by the time the British left, India's GDP was negative four. That was because uh, the British essentially, when they colonized or when any of the countries that were colonizers around the world, when they colonized a nation, they were actually raping and pillaging that nation of all of its resources, uh, using the um, 
uh, available people labor, uh, uh, you know, to run their concerns, to run their factories, to run their businesses. And what the British did in India was destroy the textile industry so that their Victorian mills up in England could sell ready-made goods to India. So uh, India, the, um, the British actually uh, broke the thumbs of the weavers in India so they could no longer um, uh, make the fine muslin and the fine silks that they were making. This is one of the reasons why you always see Gandhi at the spinning wheel because his idea was, uh, let us get our own people making our own cotton again rather than buying it from the British. So um, there were so many things that happened. The shipbuilding industry in India was so strong before the British came and they destroyed that as well so that they could sell their uh, kind of um, uh, less than uh, preferable ships <laughs> to the world. So um, uh, anyway, so I learned so many things about India. And then I realized that this is an opportunity when I started writing The Henna Artist, this is an opportunity for me to talk about the India that a lot of people don't know about. This is my 1950s India. I was born in 1958. My parents were married in 1955. This is my 1950s India. This is a land of joy. This is a land of a lot of literature. This is a land where women are reading Life and Look magazine. Um, I went to a school where I was taught by Christian nuns, uh, English all day long, and we had one hour of Hindi a day. And uh, that was because my father knew that he wanted to go abroad someday, and he knew English was gonna come in handy for the three of us to learn. Um, I was raised in an India that is filled with color and festivals and so many flowers and food that is also colorful and food that is enriching and good for your body. And so uh, in writing this book, I could infuse it with all of those sensory um, feelings that you have when you visit India. <laughs> and sometimes people call it a sensory overload and it really is like that. Uh, so I wanted to write about all of that. So I feel like the henna artist is my love letter to India. And so that's the second message I want people to, to gather from it, which is here's an India maybe you didn't hear about when you were growing up and reading your history books. These are people who have been uh, resilient over millennia uh, of uh, conquerors and invaders and colonizers, and they are still a strong country and they still remain uh, one of the best intellectual uh, powerhouses in the world today. You know, uh, you've got Indian doctors, you've got Indian mathematicians and Indian scientists and uh, you know, Indian, Indian everybody. And wherever they go in the world, they are really major contributors positive contributors to that society. So I want uh, immigrants of all types to learn that maybe their heritage has something to, um, to be proud of. Maybe their heritage did something uh, to help the world that they may not be aware of and it's time for them to maybe learn some of these things. You know, in my um, book groups and in various podcasts and interviews that I have done, I have done them all over the world. So I have spoken to Indians in India. I have spoken to Indians across the diaspora as I have spoken to uh, Latinos all over the world and, uh, you know, even just uh, cultures like uh, France, you know, I've, I've spoken in France, I've spoken to Colombians, I've spoken to Russians, <laughs> I've spoken to so many different kinds of people who say that this book is really about uh, also their culture, that they can relate to it. They can relate to this book in a way that maybe they couldn't relate to a lot of other books that they have read because they see themselves in this culture, they see themselves uh, as part of either an immigrant population or um, a population of people who have survived and thrived a lot of adversity. Wow, thank you. Uh, what uh, are your personal uh, experiences with henna? Uh, you know, every girl in India grows up seeing henna on everybody's hands. So my mother would always have it on her hands for uh, either weddings or special occasions. And so I would always say, oh, could I please mom, you know, get, can you have her put henna on my hands too? So every girl grows up with henna. You grow up with, uh, you know, seeing your aunties and your neighbors and everybody. 
And so one of the, I, I've never actually painted henna on myself and I didn't have a lot of henna done the whole time I've been in the United States. But I think I wanted to bring out one of the, I think most beautiful traditions that we have in India that is really about both a practical application and a, uh, an application of beauty. So um, women in India and women in 23 other countries where henna is applied uh, do so because it cools the body. Henna is only grown in hot and arid climates. And the plant, that, that is where the plant thrives. So in Rajasthan, where it's a desert, it thrives uh, beautifully. And Rajasthani henna is supposed to be some of the finest henna that you can buy. Um, so when the henna plant is um, processed and then turned into a fine powder uh, and you know uh, mixed with oils and all of these kinds of things, and then you start applying it to your extremities, your hands, your feet, and your head, because a lot of people do use it in their hair, um, it cools the body down. That's the practical application of henna. It also soothes your body. So it takes away a lot of anxiety. And uh, then the, um, the beautiful part of the application, of course, is that when you have weddings and you have brides have henna all up and down their arms, you know, they have more henna done on themselves than somebody would just for a festival. So they have all up and down their arms, all up and down their legs. Um, you know, today uh, you have brides uh, or you have women who are pregnant and they'll have pregnancy henna on their bellies. I didn't even know there was such a thing. I actually just invented it in my book, but I didn't even know that it was a real thing until somebody said to me, hey, uh, did you know that this is actually being done? Um, and then uh, now also another thing that's being done that I didn't know about is um, uh, henna crowns for cancer patients. So uh, when a woman has lost all of her hair, um, you know, a lot of henna artists are devoting their time and energy to designing um, henna on their skulls. And what it does, they said, is it changes the conversation. So that instead of a woman going to the supermarket and having everybody look at her uh, and like thinking, oh my gosh, you know, she has cancer. Now they'll go up to the woman and say something like, oh, you know, where did you get that beautiful design? What is that called? Is that permanent? Is it a tattoo? And it starts a different kind of conversation, one filled with more joy. So that is my experience with henna. Now in 2019, I went to India to five different cities because I wanted to understand what is life like today for women. Uh, you know, I had not been back to India since 2011. And so I thought, okay, 2019, it's a good time. Uh, you know, I'll go. And I went to the East, West, North and South. And I talked to a lot of different colleges. I talked to high schools, I talked to middle schools. And in return, I got to talk to their students about uh, their lives and about henna. One of the coolest things that happened is in Jaipur, I talked to a middle school and at the end of my talk, they said, hey, would you come around the back of the school? So I did and there was a whole other school at the back of this school and the school was geared towards village girls from Rajasthani villages around whom they bust in every day. They gave them, uh, they had a school uniform, they had books and they were learning their mats and their letters, the basic stuff but they're also learning skills like the art of henna, which was so cool because this is a way that anybody in India can actually earn a pretty good living. If you get good at it, you can earn a pretty good living doing henna. It doesn't require any formal education and it doesn't require a lot of um, uh, tools, right? So um, you don't have to you know, get a master henna kit or anything like that. You just get the powder, the henna powder, you mix it with whatever oils and things you wanna mix it with, however much lemon, however much sugar, whatever it is you wanna put in there is fine. And uh, then you just need a comb. These days, henna is applied with a comb. In my mother's time in the 1950s, as I mentioned in the novel, it was a very crude application of henna. Sometimes it was just done with a finger, you know, so all they could do was like a round circle with tiny little dots around it, or maybe a, um, you know, a, a triangle or something like that. And of course, I wanted Lakshmi to be able to have a very um, uh, 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 illustrious henna, you know, the kind of henna that she is able to make 10 times as much money doing. And so she has to be able to do this amazingly delicate and intricate henna, the kind that really wasn't being done at that time. But 
um, that is how Lakshmi is making her living. See, I, I get to do a little creative license as the author. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and then of course, Lakshmi is doing this other thing where she's actually feeding her clients. And it, it's in the ingredients that she is feeding her clients that her clients get to, uh, you know, experience their desires and, uh, you know, uh, uh, realize their dreams and things like that. They don't, of course, know that. In, in reality though, in India, if you are ever with a henna artist, you will never take food from her hands. That is actually not done. In India, you don't take food from anybody else's hands who are not related to you as a family. Uh, it stops the spread of disease. It's just something I always grew up uh, doing. You know, I've never sipped from somebody else's glass. I don't I don't eat from somebody else's sandwich. Uh, it's just something that we don't do. And so in reality in India, um, nobody would take food from a henna artist, but I wanted people to be able to, you know, take food from Lakshmi because, hey, I get to do that as the author. <laughs> so that is uh, my experience of henna. Thank you. Uh, can you talk about how you chose uh, Lakshmi's uh, name as the main character? Yeah, Lakshmi is a very popular name in India, as are Parvati and Radha. Um, uh, Lakshmi and Parvati are goddesses, uh, and uh, Lakshmi in particular is a very major goddess, uh, goddess of wealth and beauty. And my mother used to pray to Lakshmi, so that's how I chose Lakshmi. Uh, oh. Every woman in India, uh, every man in India chooses a god or a goddess that they want to um, pray to. And then in India, you know, if you're a Hindu, going to temple is an optional thing. You don't have to go to temple. If you go to temple, maybe you go to temple for five minutes before you get it to work every day. And you ring the temple bell, you do your prayer in front of your deity because they'll usually have several gods there. Uh, so you, you do your prayer in front of your deity and then you uh, put on your slippers again and walk back out. It's not a ritual like every Sunday service. It's not, it's not like that. And many uh, people choose to have their own little puja, their own little shrine uh, to their God in their home. So they'll just have that little <laughs> shrine and they will um, pray to it every day. And it's, it's kind of like a, a, a daily meditation. Oh, thank you. Uh, so food is a silent but very important character in your book. Any chance that you'll do a cookbook someday? <laughs> I don't think you want me to do a cookbook, you guys. I, I barely have time to cook at home and I am not what you would call, I think, a regular cook. But what I do remember though, is all of the times that I was helping my mother. And I do remember cutting up the cauliflower and the potatoes for her alu gobi sabji. And I remember her making um, these sweets like gulab jamun. And I remember her making samosas for us and all of these kind of special things that she made. So yes, I can duplicate those things based on how I watched her do it. But uh, I'm certainly not somebody who is like you would say, wow, she is such a great cook. No, that is not me. <laughs> But I love sharing the recipes because those are recipes of my mother's. And um, so it's fun to share them and have other people tell me that they're making those recipes and they're really delicious. And they're, you know, so I'm like, you know, this is a wonderful way for me to uh, have my mother be immortalized. You know, I, I, I feel that so much of her life uh, was small. You know, she did not get to be the person, the independent person that Lakshmi is. And so uh, I, I, I think that she lived kind of a diminished life, um, as do I think many women uh, in cultures like India, where they have to kowtow to the men uh, of, um, you know, of the society, where they have to have a second place status. Um, and so uh, I wanted to, and I've been able to, I don't know that this is really how I started out, but I've been able to, I think, immortalize my mother. And you know, now everybody knows about my mother, they know about her life. Uh, and, and I just think, oh my God, that is, that is like something I, uh, I would have hoped to be able to do, but never thought I could. I, I wanna read to you something that my mother used to give me. She used to make these little cards. You know, She would um, collect leaves and flowers and then she would press them 
dry them and press them and then make these little cards. You know, they're not, they're not like super fancy or anything, uh, but the kinds of messages that she send, sent me are so important because I think that they're the kind of messages that all girls need to receive all the time. <laughs> she says, to my loving, beautiful, smart, kind, and considerate daughter, a little token of love from your mom. And, you know, it's just, I mean, it, it breaks my heart every time, you know, I, I read any one of her little cards because um, it's in the reminders of things like that from our mothers that we really gain a lot of strength. You know, it's in those kind of reminders to know that we are loved, that, um, that somebody out there thinks that we can be bigger than we think we can be. Thank you. Uh, this is a multi-part question. Uh, you, were, you mentioned that you were executive producer for this upcoming series. Can you tell us what's involved with being uh, executive producer? Can you tell us anything about when the series might be coming? And is there any chance that some scenes will be filmed in Pacific Grove? <laughs> I doubt if anything will be filmed in Pacific Grove. <laughs> Um, the plan is to have most of it, of course, filmed in India, in Jaipur and in uh, Shimla. And um, depending on what COVID does, right? Uh, you know, they're hoping that they can start filming late 2022, but who knows uh, what's going to happen with COVID. So, um, you know, we can all cross our fingers and toes. But I think that maybe if we can't go there right away, they may do some interior sets where they can do some of the interior shots, maybe recreate those here in the United States before we get a chance to go over there. Um, it will of course have Indian, um, hopefully an Indian director and Indian, Indian uh, producer. Uh, I want all of them to be female. I want every single one of these women to be female. When I had my advertising agency, I only hired females because women don't get enough breaks. And I never got a break when I was in the corporate world. So I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna give women breaks. And so when I started my own agency, I only hired female writers, female producers, female web designers, female uh, um, event planners, uh, you know, and they just did such a beautiful job and they worked so very hard. So I have asked for the production company to please consider hiring females for all of this. I don't care if somebody thinks I'm, I'm sexist, I am sexist you know, when, it, when it comes to hiring females. So, um, uh, so um, my role as an executive producer is just a fancy way of saying I'm going to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> so when um, they have the writer's room and right now during COVID, everybody's doing writer's room just like we're doing them right now. It's like a Zoom uh, event. And I'm going to get a chance to uh, be there while they are designing the scripts, while they're figuring out who's going to say what. And I get a chance to say, well, you know, Malik wouldn't speak like that. Malik would say something like this instead. Or I get a chance to say, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you're looking for a scene that maybe Rava and Ravi could have together, here, here's 10 pages of a scene that I actually wrote. And maybe this will come in handy for that particular scene. Or here's a suggestion for another kind of scene that you guys may want to consider. So those are the kinds of things that I get to do as an executive producer. And then the rest of it, I just bank money. That's all I do. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, this, oh, oh. And, and, and Dennis, uh, so if I may add, my, my idea is because I love to learn. I love to learn new things. It's so much fun to be a creative person and, and learn new things and try out new things. So my idea is that while I am a fly on the wall, I'm going to learn how to write a screenplay. And then for books two and three, I'm going to write the screenplay for those. <laughs> I'm not giving that up for anybody else. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, the question is, I find the idea of reimagining the life of one's mother very fascinating. Um, did your mother lead you in that direction herself, uh, perhaps in conversations? Never. Or no. is it your projection of what you wish your mother could have had? It's completely my projection. I, I, you know, when my mother read portions of my novel and she realized that I was making the main character a henna artist, she goes, she laughed and she goes, well, honey, I, I don't think I could ever be a henna artist. 
<laughs> but you know, you know, whatever you want to do with your novel is fine. Uh, but I, my mother was studying psychology at the time that she was taken out of college to be married to my dad. And um, she would really like to have gone forward with that degree and probably, you know, maybe she would have become a psychologist if she'd had a chance. So henna, henna work wasn't really something that I think she would have done. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, do you, uh, another question was, do you see similarities between the henna artist and present day hairstylists with uh, regard yeah. to their uh, relationship with their clients in yes. terms of secrets and such? Oh, yes. What a good question. Because, of course, you know, uh, I don't know who asked that question, but maybe they've heard me say this before. But my hairstylist, Gary, is uh, my inspiration for how Lakshmi conducts her business. I have been going to Gary for 30 years. 30 years he has been cutting my hair. And when I go to his studio, he's always been a one man band. So he just has the one chair and the one shampoo bowl. And he has a, he has a little studio and it's beautifully decorated. And um, he always has uh, some kind of aromatherapy diffuser going on. And he has beautiful music going on that is, you know, kind of relaxing and uh, calming. And uh, so you come in and then he gets you to the shampoo bowl. He washes your hair. And when he's got the conditioner in there, then he takes his aromatherapy, he takes his essential oils and he starts rubbing your temples and giving you a little face massage and then your scalp massage. And then he rinses all of that off and then he takes you to the chair. He turns you away from the mirror and uh, puts the cape on and he says, okay, now nighty night, it's time for your beauty coma. We're not gonna talk while I focus on cutting your hair. So, uh, of course, then when he does the unveiling, you know, he turns you around to the mirror and you get to see what he's done. And it's just, you know, fabulous. And you're like, thank you. Thank you, Gary. And then he hands you a latte. I mean, what service is that? You feel so loved. You feel so well taken care of. You just feel like, oh, my God, you know, if, if everybody were like this in my life, I would feel like a queen. So this is how I wanted Lakshmi to make her ladies feel feel so good. You know, she finds the pressure points. She does the massages while her their henna is drying. It's very important for her to be that kind of person, a nurturing person to them, because maybe they don't get a lot of self-care time in their life. They are so busy doing all these other things and being high society ladies and, you know, throwing parties for the politicians that maybe they don't get a chance to take care of themselves that way. The other thing that being with Gary uh, taught me is how willing you are to share with somebody who is touching you and doing something uh, of a service like that. So same thing with a masseuse. I think you tend to maybe tell your masseuse things that you wouldn't tell other people. Uh, the, you're, you're maybe you're the person who does your nails or any kind of service person whom you are gonna spend an hour with and they're gonna be touching you in this very intimate way. I think you start telling them your secrets. And this is what Lakshmi does. And she is a keeper of so many people's secrets. <laughs> oh, well, we just have another question or two, Alkut, and we'll be finishing up. Um, boy, just very moving to hear you speak about your mother and to know that she is infused throughout your book. Um, I wonder about some of your other female relatives. Um, how did they perhaps shape you as you were growing up as well? You know, um, I am sorry to say that I really don't have uh, other female relatives whom I am close to because we kept moving. We were, so, uh, we were such a different kind of family in India. Most families stay rooted to where they were born and where their whole family is. Nobody wants to move away too far from their families, but we were constantly moving from city to city to city. So we were never around my aunts and uncles. And to this day, I don't know all of my aunts and uncles names. I don't know their, I don't know all of their uh, cousins, uh, my cousins and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I've met a few of them on my trips back and forth to India, but not everybody. Um, and I think that, um, you know, my grandmothers were not a big part of my life also, I think because of that, because they stayed close to home. My grandmothers were very, very homebound sort of people. And so we, we weren't really 
anywhere near them most of the time. And then when we went to America, we weren't the kind of family that came back uh, to India every year and visited with family. I don't know why, we just weren't that kind of family. So I grew up in a very, um, uh, uh, very different kind of household. And I grew up in a very progressive household. So my father, when we came here, he said, listen, if any of the kids have you go to their churches, if any of the kids want you to go to their synagogue, go to their Catholic church, go to their Presbyterian church, if they invite you, go, because you might be interested in another religion other than Hinduism, and that's perfectly okay. Or he would say to my uh, brothers, there's a liquor cabinet, there's the rum, there's the gin, there's the, 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 the scotch, you want to drink? You, you bring your friends over here and drink at home. Please do not let, let me catch you trying to sneak in beer, you know, like some low life, you know, just come over here and drink at home. Mm -hmm. um, and then my mother said to me, of course, um, you know, when, when I first went away to Stanford, I had never had a boyfriend before. I'd been a very studious child and I never um, thought that anybody would be interested in me. I was really shy, so I never got asked to dance. And I thought, gosh, I must be the ugliest girl in the world. I don't know what's wrong with me. But then I go away to Stanford and it was so different. You know, uh, the, the, the boys there were smart and they were interested and, you know, interesting. And so um, I, I had a boyfriend. So when I came back uh, home, I, you know, I was 18 years old and I came back home for Christmas and I said, mom, and there's this guy I think I want to sleep with. And she goes, okay, tomorrow we're going to go to the doctors and we're going to get you some birth control pills. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just be careful. Just don't have a baby until you are, uh, you know, able to graduate and until you are able to sustain yourself financially. That's all I ask. <laughs> So, you know, I grew up with super progressive parents and I think that um, it's, uh, it, it, what a gift, what a gift. You know, we, we, we do not, we're just not traditional kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And most, uh, I think all three of us have traveled a lot over the world and we've been in a lot of different places and uh, it's been uh, just a wonderful way, I think, to grow up and live. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it, it just sounds very special, very special. So uh, <laughs> a little question just popped in from several of our listeners. Um, they would love to know Gary's business name. <laughs> oh, you, know, you know what I'm going to do, Kim? Uh, when, I when I send you uh, this little thank you that I'm going to send you, it has all of my contact information. And I'll put Gary's contact information there, too, because, hey, if you want to patronize him, uh, you know, during this time, I'm he would love it because his <laughs> studio can't be open. And so, um, you know, he's finding out very interesting ways to do uh, outdoor haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, good for him. So, yes, yeah, so I'll definitely get that and we'll pass it along. Um, boy, Alka, you're just your your stories, you're being yourself such a gift. And I think. Um, the fact that the henna artist came along when it did meant that for so many people who were sort of homebound and constricted and the world of masks and everything else, you gave them just this beautiful world, these wonderful relationships, this color, this, this excitement that really helped make a difference. So we thank you for that. And I'm just so sorry that we didn't get to start off your book tour with that great event we were planning in the museum. That would have been- I know, been we had a dancer plan <laughs> and you know, and all that wonderful samosa and chai. Oh. And, but you know what, we'll do it again. Uh, maybe not for the sequel in June, <laughs> no. if the library is still not open, yeah. but uh, you know, maybe we'll get a chance to do it you know, at some, some other time. Oh, we uh, definitely would love that. Before I go, I'm going to take um, a screenshot of all of us, all right? Okay. So yes. uh, whoever is not yet on the screen, if you want to be on this shot, mm -hmm. I'm gonna send it over to Kim uh, as a Friends of the Library sort of uh, tradition, okay? One, two, three. Okay, one more, one more time. I'm gonna do one more time. Uh, because uh, I have two pages here. All right. <laughs> and one, two, three. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for loving the book. Thank you so much. I've, I've spoken to several libraries now and people tell me that there, like there's 600 people on a waiting list in various libraries. 
And I am overwhelmed with gratitude for all these people who are reading this book at this time. It is, it is an amazing thing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Alka. Thank you so much. And for anyone that hasn't had the chance to read The Hen Artist yet, um, Bookworks does have copies of the book still available. Sometimes they go out of, uh, they sell them all off, but we just checked and they have them available. And of course, the library has them as well um, to be put on the holds list and picked up safely and distancely in the front. Oh, thank you so much, Alka. You made a very unusual meeting just wonderful and feel as personable as though we were all together. All right, you guys, have a great 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to be wrapping up our annual meeting. I really do want to thank, first of all, um, Sandy and Dennis for sort of running the PowerPoints and running the chat and making all that go so smoothly. I want to thank the annual meeting committee that started off being Stephanie and Sonia, um, Judy, Abby, Dennis, then grew to be Linda, then grew to be Peggy, then grew to be Lisa, then grew to be Sonia. I mean, everybody that helped put this together. It was really an adventure. We weren't sure how it was going to work, um, but we knew it was so important to do this because of all of you, our members, who make us who we are and make it possible for us to support our wonderful library in the way that we've been able to in this past year and in the way that we're really looking forward to in 2021. Um, so we just wanna thank each and every one of you for being a friend. We promise we'll get more information, more news and updates about the library in our um, next newsletter. I think it will come out in March and um, always keep looking at our website too. So again, thank you so much for being a friend. Um, Thank you for being a part of our first Zoom experience. And until we get to see each other in person again, we would like to ask you to please stay well, take good care of yourselves and each other, and as always, keep reading. Thank you. Okay.